wondrous, wondrously fair. And they say that it's splendor. Well, it's far beyond compare. In a place that's called heaven, my soul. streets they were not gold if my mansion it crumbled and the folks they still grew old well still I'd see everything that I've been longing to see for Jesus he will be what makes it him 
while you're standing, take your hymnal this morning. Turn to page number five. Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. Let's sing the first and the last. Jesus paid it all. Page number five. good singing today uh, turn around and shake hands one with another smile and wave whatever you're able to do today before you're seated amen good to see you in the house of god this morning we want to welcome you into the service and if there's anybody visiting with us for the first time would you lift up your hand hold your hand up let the ushers find you. You fill out that card, drop it in the offering bag as it passes by, and we'd love to have a record of your visit. But we want to welcome you into the service today. Pray for our pastor and his wife. Of course, Dad's a little under the weather uh, today with his uh, dental work that he had done, and uh, he was at the emergency room yesterday, and so they told him not to take it easy for a few days, and so he's doing that. But they should be watching by streaming, so we welcome the streaming audience to us as well. And welcome our pastor and his dear wife watching at home. We also want to have special prayer for Harold Taylor, Linda Clapp, and Wayne Moore. We had these requests come in today. And then the children's CD, we're doing one song for the children for Christmas uh, with the choir. And that CD is on the table. If your child has not gotten that CD, uh, you can pick that up on the table. And uh, we'll tell you more about that maybe tonight even. But that CD is on the table. Ushers, you come. We'll receive the tithes and the offerings today, and you give today as the Lord leads. Good to be in the house of God. Amen. Brother Rick, would you lead us in prayer? Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you once again for allowing us back in your house, Lord. Lord, we thank you we have a house like this we can come to, Amen. Lord, just to thank you, Lord. put aside the world for just a little while, Lord, and to focus on you, Lord. We thank you for the sweet Holy Spirit that fills this place every time we hear, Lord. Amen. We thank you for what's been felt already here this morning, Lord. We thank you for the songs that have been sung, the hands that have been raised, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless in this service. Bless our Sunday school, Lord. We thank you for what we felt down there this morning, Lord. Continue to help it to grow and be strong, Lord. For those that are sick and couldn't be here today, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you'd touch them in a mighty way, Lord. You are the great physician, Lord, and I pray that you'd lay your hand upon them according to your will, Lord, and touch them, Lord. Heal them, Lord, if it be your will. Lord, for those that are mourning, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would touch them this week, Lord. Help them, Lord. Give them that grace that only you can do, Lord. That's right. Be with the remainder of this service this morning, Lord. Be with Sammy as he brings the message, Lord. Touch him this morning. Lift him up, Lord. Anoint him from on high, Lord. Bless Amen. this offering, for it's in the name of Jesus we do ask. Amen. Amen. Amen.
I appreciate the good singing and the playing this morning. It's good to see you this morning. If you will, take your uh, Bibles this morning. Turn to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 29. 2 Chronicles chapter 29. This is page 517 in your old Schofield Bible. <clears throat> 2 Chronicles 29. And when you get there, say amen. Amen. Y'all, y'all Pastor k has got you trained. He, he mentions it twice, and he's there, and it uh, goes. But I'll give you a little more time. Second Chronicles is kind of hard book to find. We actually want to start reading in chapter 28, the first two verses, of, or first verse of chapter 28, Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 28, the Bible says, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. But he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And if you go over now to ver, uh, chapter 29, or we'll stay in verse uh, chapter 28, I want to look at verse uh, 23, verse 23. For he sacrificed, you want to say, what did he do wrong? Well, for he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him, and he said, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them, that they may help me, but they were the ruin of him and of all of Israel. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God. And this is my text, I want you to underline this, and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. I want to preach for just a moment, if I may, this morning on the doors of the church are broken the doors of the church are broken and if you have paid any attention to the news or you watch what we're going through in our society um, I heard just last night watching a man he said if we're gonna take care of this COVID if we're gonna take care of the other things and he even mentioned some even mentioned the common flu he said it'd be good to shut the churches down it'd be good if we could shut any of these mass gatherings down Never mentioned a ball team, never mentioned a stadium, because there's too much money going on in those places. But he did mention the church house, because you, you really, we really don't realize the power that we have as the church and what we are doing in America and what we're doing in the world. The church is still the salt of the earth, and the church is still going strong. And the Bible says the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. I'm glad I'm part of the church this morning. And so we look at Ahaz, he became a king. Now, his fathers before him did what was right in the sight of the Lord. But the Bible tells us in chapter 28, he didn't do what was right in the sight of the Lord. And the Bible says because of that, now look, he was a religious man. The Bible says he made sacrifices unto the gods of Damascus. He said, they helped Damascus, so I'm going to sacrifice unto them so that they'll help me. But he didn't realize that all his help comes from the Lord. And so he made a terrible mistake, and the Bible says it was the ruin of him. You want to ruin yourself, you stop serving God, and you give credit to this world, or you give credit to your job, or you give credit to your parents or whomever for your success. All that I am today and all that you are today is because of Jesus Christ. And we better never forget where we come from. That's the problem with America today, that this country is a Christian nation. It was built on the principles of God. I say that without apology. But we are not a Christian nation any longer. We don't act like a Christian nation. But I'm not here to preach politics. I'm not here to preach about the world or the shape it's in. I'm here to preach about the church. It was one bad decision that closed the doors of the church. Look at me now. Ahaz said, and it shut up the doors of the house of the Lord, and he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. There's never any other place designed that we're supposed to worship other than the house of God. 
He said, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together in the manner of some is, but so much the more as we see the day approaching. I'm here to still preach to you. Jesus is still coming. Jesus is coming. You may not believe it. I didn't get many shouts on that. Are y'all, do y'all not believe Jesus is coming because he's tarried so long? The Bible says he that said he would come would come and will not tarry. Jesus has not tarried. He is waiting for that time that no man knoweth the day nor the hour when he comes. But Jesus is coming again. And I'm looking forward. I even say, as the Bible says, even so, Lord, come quickly. But if he's not coming, I'm still commanded, and you are still commanded to occupy till he comes. And so we look at the church. This is where we're supposed to occupy. Well, it ruined Ahaz. But look at verse chapter 29. Hezekiah, this is his son, began to reign when he was five and 20 years old. Young people all over the building today, your age is no excuse for not serving God. Don't, don't live like hell today, teenager, and look around and say, I can have plenty of time to serve God. I'll serve time when I'm married. I'll serve time when I get older. No, now is the time to serve God in your youth. You need to be serving God now, and that's what Hezekiah did. And he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abijah, or Abijah, uh, the daughter of Zechariah. I noticed that his father is not mentioned. Why? Because he did not what was right in the sight of God. All right, I'm going to show you that. You said, why do you mention that? I'm going to mention it just a little later. Keep your mind on that. But look at what they say about Hezekiah, verse 2. And he did that which was right. In the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done, he in his first year of his reign. Now look, number one, we're going to see his work. One man closed the doors of the church house. One man sacrificed and took the, the things of the, the, the materials of the church house and went out and made heathen altars to it. And he closed the doors of the church house. One man. One bad decision. But I'm glad that God is full of grace. I'm glad God's full of mercy, as Miss Linda sang this morning for Sunday school. And Hezekiah comes after his father, and he says, I'm not going to do that because I know what my fathers did. My fathers Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all that came before and who built this temple. And I'm going to do what's right. I'm here to tell you we are one decision away from closing the doors of the church. One bad decision away, but we're also one good decision away from finding mercy and grace and help in our time of need. Do we not need mercy today? Do we not need grace today in our churches and in our homes and in our world? And so Hezekiah does the work. Here's the work. Look at verse 3. In his first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. So number one, what we are to do if we're to fix the doors of the church house, we've got to open them up. The door, I don't, I don't think any of you will go home today and go to your house and climb through the window or climb up on the roof and try to go through the top or the chimney, even though it's that time of year. <laughs> You're going to enter your house today by the door. And we're going to enter this church. We don't come in by any other way. We come in by the door of the church. And that's the important part. The doors must be opened up. But today in many churches, and I don't want this set of truth missionary, but I see it. I watch, I'm watching a friend of mine, his church is going through so much turmoil right now. And they voted their pastor out in the parking lot last week. And I'm talking turmoil. But what do you expect when you go pick up a funny book and start reading out of it instead of the King James Bible? You've, you've asked for Ichabod to be written on your door when you turn against the Word of God. I say that without apology. The NLT, the ESV, the RSV, and all those other editions, they're all straight out of hell to try to confuse you and try to mess you up, and that'll end up, that's just like what Ahaz did. He took the precious, the precious furniture of what was in the, the temple, and he destroyed them and made them idols. And it closed the church house. But Hezekiah, number one, opened them up. There's lots on many doors today. We see the lock of pride, but we believe in whosoever will. The Bible says pride goeth before destruction 
and a haughty spirit before a fall. And the reason some people have so many problems in church is because they've changed Bibles, they've changed doctrine, then now their doctrine's changed. And when you start believing funny books, then you believe funny doctrines. That's a new cart religion, and it won't work. God has one way, and that's God's way, and that's the only way. And so they have this new cart religion, but they're too proud to repent and change and go back. We don't need change in America. You know what we need? We need to go back to where we used to be, where men and women work for a living. You hear me? Where we didn't, we weren't so, uh, the minority didn't have rule, the majority did. The majority rules. If we vote a majority, that's what's supposed to happen. And we have to live with it. But we've changed. Everybody's about change. You keep your change. Give me my money back. But we don't need that. We don't need change. We need to open them up. But pride keeps us from doing that. That's the reason we keep going in a further mess in our everywhere else is usually pride. It's a lock of the doors of the church. Number two, a lock is prejudice. And I'm not talking about just race or color. I'm talking about Galatians 3.28 says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are one in Christ Jesus. Do you realize in the body of Christ today, there is not a man, there is not a woman, there is not a boy, there is not a girl, there is not a black, there is not a white, there is none of that, a Jew or a Gentile. It's, we're the church. But we look at prejudice when somebody walks in, we look at how they're dressed, or how they act, or where they, I don't care what you look like when you walk in the door. I don't care. You better act right, but I don't care what you've been doing. I don't care if you drank a fifth of liquor last night. You can sit on the front with me. I didn't ask you to preach. I'm just telling you, the church ought to be a welcome place for hurting people. We can't look at someone because they've been through a divorce or they've committed adultery or some sin in their life or they're an addict or they're a drunkard. I'm here. That's where they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be here. They're supposed to see this place, pull in and walk through the door of the church, unlocked and know they're in a place where they can be loved. That's the church. But we have the lock of pride, the lock of prejudice. We have the lock of position. Romans 12, 3 says not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. There are no big eyes and little U's here. Nobody's more important than the other. We're all the same. And if we could get that kind of unity where we're all the same and we huddle together and we work together, this church could go farther and farther for God when we work together. Amen. Unity. How can two walk together except they be agreed? That's what the Bible said. A three-cord strand is unbreakable. The Bible says when we're in unity, we're unbreakable. And then, of course, we ought to take the lock of politics off. I hate politics. I'm sick of politics. I made it after Trump lost the election. I'm, I, I'm not getting political, don't worry. But I'm saying after I lost the election, I decided I'm not going to watch the news at all. Do you realize that's been the happiest months of my life? You say, well, you don't want to be informed? I am informed. I got the book. I know exactly what's going to happen. No matter what, I go to my job. I, I read tidbits here and there from whatever, but I don't watch any media, not even for, they're all liars. They're all trying to propagate to get you defeated and discouraged and depressed. If we'd all cut the television off and we'd get in the book of the Word of God and read what Jesus said, we'd be a happier people. Trust in the Lord with all your might and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy path. Try it. See, I challenge you. Cut off that TV and the news for the week. Just cut it off and read that book every time you want to know something and you'll be walking around happier. Your stress level will drop. Man, I'm diabetic and my diabetes is gone. Hallelujah. I say that because I'm going to go eat K&S today and I'm going to get that diabetes up. <laughs> but we have to open the doors of the church. But look at what Hezekiah did next. Not only did he open them up, but he fixed them up. Look, at he said not only opened the house of the Lord, but repaired them. There needs some bees from repairs. You know, doors stick, doors squeak, and doors swell. 
Does that sound familiar? I think we started acting like our doors. Got squeakers, swellers, things of that nature. But you got to repair the doors. You know what the doors need when they squeak and they swell and all that? They need adjustment and they need oiling. You know what the oil is a type of in the Bible? The Holy Spirit. You know what this church and every other church in the world needs more than anything? It's not better facilities. It's not the best singing. It's not the best preaching. It's not any of that. What the church needs is a filling of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking every Sunday you ought to get up and you ought to pray that God fills you a fresh filling, but that God fills the house of God. Fills it up where when there's a sinner walks in, he's so uncomfortable in this place, not because of the way we're acting or what the preacher's preaching. He's uncomfortable because the Holy Spirit is on his trail. He's convicting him just like he convicted you and convicted me. That's the way you get saved. That's the way you build a church. You don't split a church to build it. You don't go get another church to come in and build it. You build it by people getting filled with the Holy Ghost and letting the Holy Ghost convict. I'm talking convict. When you're sitting in the pew, I, nobody had to tell me I was lost. Nobody had to walk back and say, Sammy, it's time. No, Daddy's preaching on hell. We watched the Burning Hell movie by Estes Perkle on that Friday night with our youth. And that man's head went rolling off that motorcycle. Y'all remember that? We, that? Back then, that was like, wow, shock factor. That old Harley rider, and that's what I was always raised around. I like Harleys. I like motorcycles. And all of a sudden, as a kid, I'm watching, and his head decapitated, and it ro- that helmet rolls. And he ended up burning in hell, screaming and crying. Young people, listen to me. Don't sacrifice your life and burn in hell. It's no place for anybody. If you're walked in today, don't go to hell for anybody. You don't have to. Jesus spread out his arms and died on a cross so that you and I didn't have to go to hell. And I watched that man's head do that. And I couldn't sleep Saturday. I was uncomfortable. It was on my mind. Sunday morning, Dad got up and preached that your name can be written. You do not have to go to hell. And I came down. I gave my heart to Jesus. I've never regretted it. I've never. There's been times I hadn't lived up to it. There's been times I've failed and even acted like I wasn't saved at all. But I'm glad to tell you I'm saved eternally because I never forget the moment where I said Lord I am a sinner I am sorry come into my heart save me right now and he did he did do you remember the day I remember the day I said do you remember your day I, somebody ought to shout in here if you've been saved you ought to rejoice you ought to at least lift that hand up and say thank you Lord for the day that you passed by my way and you saved my ever dying soul I'm glad I'm saved I don't apologize he opened the doors but then he fixed them he with the oil of the Holy Spirit. You realize doors must be able to open and close freely. You know why a door opens, swings both ways. The door opens for an opportunity to worship. The door also opens for an opportunity to work. When we come in, we open that door, you have an opportunity to worship. That door is a door of opportunity. But when we leave here today, we take what we have and what we've heard, and as we walk out, that door opens again. It gives us an opportunity not to just worship coming in, but to work going out. We could go out and tell others about Christ. That's my burden. That Philippians study has really challenged me because Paul said, all I want to do, I want to know Christ. I want to know him in an intimate way, and that's my desire. So Hezekiah opened them up. He fixed them up. But look at number three. It says, and he brought in the priests, but then he said unto them in verse five, hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord your God, your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. He opened them up. 
He fixed them up, but then he cleaned them up. The doors of the church and the church house need to be clean. We don't always act clean. We sin. I'm thankful for 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, aren't you? But stop claiming it so much all the time. We can claim it all the time. Don't get me wrong. But we live in a state that it gives us an excuse to live in sin. It's called willful sinning. We're all going to sin. We're all going to fail. We're going to walk out of this door today and somebody's going to fail because that's our old human nature. But to go out of these doors today and willfully sin, got it on your mind right now instead of listening to me, you got it on your mind where you're going to leave this place and go out and sin and you already got it on your mind. And that's what we got to clean up. He said sanctify first yourselves. Then sanctify the building. We can't have a sanctified or a clean church until we have a clean self. We got to clean ourselves first. We got to confess our sins. And He is faithful. He is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But once we're cleansed, then we can clean the church up. Oh, and it won't be you going to sister so and so or brother so and so and saying, Now I'm clean. Now it's time for you to get clean. No. That's where the Spirit comes in. When we're clean, the Spirit's not grieved. The Spirit's not quenched. The Spirit can move and convict others of their sin. You take care of the boat mode in your eye, and I'll take care of the beam in mine. That's what the Bible commands us to do. It's not your job to clean somebody else's household up. You're to love them on. I should have got more amens out of that. It's not our job to clean our neighbor's house. It's our job to clean our house. Amen. I'm glad. I'm going to make you shout today. This is about the church. They had to get rid of the past. And he said, take that filthiness and get it out. All right? Sanctify it. But number four, I want you to look at this. Not only did he open them, he fixed them, he cleaned them, but then he lit them up. He lit them up. For our fathers... Have trespassed. Now look, I met, told you I mentioned, he didn't mention his father the first because the first, he did what was wrong. But he said, For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. Also, they have shut up the doors of the porch, and look at what it says here, and put out the lamps. Put out the lamps. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. It's a fact you have a light. You remember the little song? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And then it was the second verse. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm, I got little kids doing that. Yeah, I'm glad y'all still learning that. Good job, Wes. Wes the he, say, he teaches the kids how to the singing and the voices. But hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. All right? We have a light. I came in this morning because I was actually even running a little late. I got here at 535. But Dad gets here at 5. I, even on Sunday morning, he told me yesterday, I won't be, you handle it all. He said, you get up there and make sure the heat's on. He gave me the whole spill of what I was supposed to do. I got here at 535 and I was praying because there's nothing wrong with him except his mouth. I was praying. God, please don't let him already have the lights on. I did. I prayed. Then he'll say, where you been? I can hear it now. It's 535. Where you been? I got up at 3 o'clock. You can ask Britt. Britt said, do people arrive that early? And I'm like, no. I said, nobody's there. But I got to study. And I got to teach Sunday school. And I got I to gotta get it on before Dad gets there. I was rushing out. You can ask her. I was a nervous wreck. But it was a joy. When you walked in, it was dark. I sent Britt a picture this morning. I said, it's spooky over here at 5 in the morning. <laughs> because the lights are on a timer in the parking lot. So they're off. The sign is off. We got just the lights on the side of the building, but it was dark. Man, I pulled out the old M&P shield. For you non-gun people, that's a gun. Just kidding. But I, I did. I put one in the chamber. You know, I had it ready, and I put it on my side, and I had my hand the whole time. And I walked in, because we've got, if you go out by the old bus, we've got some homeless people that have dropped some clothes behind the old bus and been sleeping out there in the, 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 
the bus. And so, anyway, I don't know who's around, but I'm by myself. But you know what made the biggest difference of all when I walked in this place? Hit that light switch. Then I go to the next hall, hit the light switch. You know what? Before long, I didn't have my hand on my gun anymore. I didn't worry about who was it. And the doors are all open. That's really stupid, isn't it? But you know what made me more comfortable? The light. You know what it makes sinners and people searching for a church and everything? is not to see the grandeur of the church, but to see the light. To see somebody worship. To see somebody go to the altar. To see a choir. Brother Brian Haney came, the pastor, he just moved uh, to Georgia. But he was talking about when he came in, he said he saw people in the choir smiling. I was like, where? Show me. <laughs> just kidding, choir. But it's good to know when somebody's singing victory in Jesus, they actually believe there's victory in Jesus. Yes. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works. He lit them up. And then lastly, he lifted them up. He said, you know what they've not done? They've not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. You know what incense is a type of? Prayer. You know what the best thing you can do for a church? Pray. Best thing you can do for your pastor? Pray. And you say, well, I'll get in the car for us, pastor, bless the church today. If that's how you want to pray, fine. But there's going to have to be a humbling part in your prayer life where you get on your face before God or your private area. The Bible talks about the closet or an altar. That's what altars are for, where you say, I don't care what people think, what people do. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to get a hold of God. I'm not telling you to pray an hour. No, I'm not telling you any of that. I'm just telling you with a sincere heart, you say, God, bless my pastor. God, bless my pastor's wife. God, bless our church. God, give us souls for our labor. I want to see souls get saved. It should never, ever stop being our number one priority and desire is to see souls walk an aisle and give their heart to Jesus. But we have to pray. And that's for, pray, the Bible tells us, pray without ceasing. That means not stopping, but that's talking about being in a constant frame of mind where we pray. But I want you to look at this. What happens when there's no prayer? Look at verse 8 through 10. The wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem and delivered them into trouble, to astonishment and to hissing, as ye see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters are, and wives are in captivity for this. And now it is mine heart. I love Hezekiah's heart. Uh, we've lost a lot of young people because they just don't think church is important anymore. We've lost a lot of members in the past because they just don't think after COVID happened, some of them will never come back because they don't think church is important any longer. That's exactly what this, but look at Hezekiah's heart in verse 10. Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. Now I told you to remember the fathers. Look at this, verse 11. My sons, I got two of them back there. I got two sons. I'm not downgrading women at all, don't you get me wrong, but men are supposed to be leaders. Men are supposed to make a stand and be leaders, especially in worship. Sad day when our men are more sissy than, you can't even tell them apart that our women are leading in worship and leading in exam by example, and I applaud you ladies for stepping up for your sorry man. That's tough preaching, isn't it? But men are supposed to be leaders. They're supposed to lead, not by force, but by authority. And I've got sons. And Hezekiah said, my dad failed. My dad, he did what was wrong. And I'm going to do what's right. But he don't forget about his sons. He said, y'all don't go the way of my, your grandfather. Y'all don't go away the way and fail. He said, my sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him to serve him and that he should minister that you should minister unto him and burn incense you know what he said you're to pray you're to lead you're to serve you're to worship and i'm telling you young men of this church 
Don't let football, basketball, girls, cars, this world or anything take the place of you serving Jesus. You take Jesus and you serve him without apology and you don't back down and you stand and God will use you greatly. I'd rather my sons do that than to ever score a point in a game. And I love sports. My boys play. I coach. I love all of that. I love cars. I love fishing. I love everything. I hate golf. But I love everything. But I'd rather them know Jesus. So our doors could be broken, but they don't have to be. We can open them up. We can fix them up. We can clean them up. We can light them up. And we can lift them up. I'm glad that God gives this. And I close with this. If you go read the rest of that chapter, they start worshiping. They start singing. Hezekiah goes into the house of the Lord, and he says, The work was ended, and so the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. After he did that, the house of the Lord was set in order. You know, there's an order of how the church of God is supposed to act, how we're supposed to worship. I think we're as close to a New Testament church as any church I know of. Singing, hymns, spiritual songs, encouraging ourselves, preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the blood, the book, the blessed hope. That's the order of the church. Let's stand, please. I want you to just to get a, a glimpse of your church today.